Hello, and welcome to What is Innovation? The podcast that explores the reality of a word that is in danger of losing its meaning altogether. This podcast is produced by Outlast Consulting, LLC, a boutique consultancy that helps companies use innovation principles to solve their toughest business problems. I'm your host, Jared Simmons, and I'm so excited to have Raji Rajagopalan. Raji Rajagopalan believes that your differentness is your differentiator. She is author of the book, Daring to be Different, Stories and Tips from a Woman Leader in Tech, a collection of stories to help you build the most important skills to have a meaningful career. In her day job, Raji is a partner director of software engineering at Microsoft. In the last 20 years in the tech industry, her work has spanned building startup teams, turning around unsuccessful projects, driving engineering rigor, scaling online services, growing global teams, and innovating on products used by more than a billion customers. She currently runs an organization across five countries and four continents. You can learn more about her on her website, rajiraj.com, R-A-J-I-R-A-J.com. Raji, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for agreeing to join us. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Me too, Jared. I'm very excited to be here. And thank you for inviting me to be part of your show. Of course, of course. Well, let's dive right in. What, in your mind, is innovation? It's an excellent question, Jared. I think a lot about innovation as part of my day job. As you pointed out, I'm a director of software engineering in Microsoft. I have been in this industry for several years now, coming up on two decades. And I think a lot about innovation and technology. The field of technology is all about innovating. As I think about what it really means, to me, innovation is about imagining things that are not in existence, that add to humanity in some way, that present value to humanity, and in addition to that, to be able to land those things successfully in market. Mm. So let's deconstruct that sentence, right? So first of all, you need to be able to imagine things that are not in existence. These are not like incremental little things like, you know, you move the needle from 0.5% to 0.55%. Right. It's more imagining a completely new thing out there. We talk a lot about AI recently in technology. You know, a lot of companies, including my company, Microsoft, you're working a lot in AI. And that is an example of what innovation is. With AI, we're really thinking about a world that doesn't exist yet. 50 years from now, the world is going to look very different from what it looks today because of AI. Mm -hmm. And it's all that power of imagination, bringing forth to the world something that doesn't exist at all, a different way of doing things, really, a different way of learning things, a different way of automating, a different way of producing things. So many things are going to be very different, and it's just an exciting time to really live through. And that is what I think of as innovation, really imagining things, but it has to add value to humanity as well. Mm. I think it's a, it's a very important part of innovation. It has to move the needle for humanity in some way, produce something of use to humans. You know, we build technology for people. It's not like we have people to produce technology. I strongly believe that technology should be for people, right? So I think it has to add value to humanity. It may be something that you know is solving an existing problem, or it may be something that is thinking of a way in which you know people have not even thought of the problem yet, right? So I think it has to add value to humanity. And lastly, we need to be able to land these things successfully in market. At Microsoft, we have three leadership principles to be able to create clarity, to generate energy, and to deliver success. And that last bit, how you deliver success, is an important part of uh, innovation. You mentioned that I am an author of uh, this new book called Daring to be Different, Stories and Tips from a Woman Leader in Tech. And I talk about this a lot in terms of career skills that people need to have in order to have success in their own career. And as I was thinking about it, when I wrote the book and subsequently as I was starting to think about your podcast as well, I think these career skills that I talk about in my book are very relevant to how we land products successfully in market as well. So the career skills I talk about include Courage, agility, resilience, experimentation, storytelling, prioritization, learning. All of these are important skills for you to have success in your career, especially as a minority in tech, such as I am. I'm a woman leader in tech. Mm -hmm. But also for a product, right? you need to have the courage to take risks, to be able to imagine something that doesn't exist that may or may not have a product market fit. 
but you need to have the courage to imagine it. You need to be agile, be nimble as you learn from prototypes and MVPs and be able to pivot when something doesn't work in market. You need to not really dwell on your failures. You need to be able to withstand failures and have the resilience to try again and try again and try again until you can succeed. You also need to be able to experiment, take little baby steps. So all of these seven skills that I talk about in your career, I feel like they're also important for delivering success as you innovate in market. Does that make sense, Jared? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I love that definition of innovation and the connection to humanity and the connection to things that are not currently in existence. So I think that lends itself to a number of different sort of interpretations and also that you can have a different mindset in terms of if something doesn't exist, that sort of implies that you have to dream it up. Right. That takes you down a certain path of, well, how would I go about coming up with something like that? Right. If it has to be a benefit to humanity, that begs the question, well, how do I know? How can I tell that this is a value to humanity, which takes you down a path around how do I generate insights from consumers and users that validate or confirm that this is something of use to humanity. Right. And so I think built into your definition of innovation are all the critical components of the creative, ideative end of things. Right. But also, how do you set a path right. and drive metrics and things off of that path? Absolutely. So I think it's a very complete definition. And then looking at the aspect of how it ties into your book and your insights on leadership, that the list of the seven attributes could easily be a list of seven attributes of an innovation work process right? or the principles of an innovation council. So yeah, I think there's just a hand in glove kind of fit to everything you laid out. I love it. And I also love how you have kind of touched upon the entire process of innovation, right? Like there is the creative angle to it, which is the imagining of things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you know, as, a, as especially as a software engineer, you know, I've been in this field for several years now. As a software engineer, my craft tends to be very logical in nature. You know, everything that I've been trained in is super logical, really right? very methodical, systemic thinking. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's kind of like you always think of engineers as these people that are very involved in very logical and mathematical thinking. But I think the process of creating new things, you know, innovation technology that you're dreaming up, like you said, mm -hmm. I think it's very creative in nature. You really have to engage that the right brain, so to speak, in order to be able to imagine new things and innovate. But once you do that, it's not as though you, it's a waterfall, you do that, and then you move to the next process. Right. So the next part of the process of innovation is very logical in nature, right? Mm -hmm. Like all these step-by-step -step little baby steps and iterating on your MVP and figuring out the product market fit and getting customer signals and figuring out if these metrics are meeting your targets. And if not, how do you make sure that you're pivoting at the right moment? How do you gather customer feedback? How do you set the right OKRs and metrics in place in order to measure your success? Mm -hmm. All of that then becomes very process and sort of logical in nature and in almost a, in, a, in a scientific mathematical way. But then as you're doing that, once again, if something doesn't fit, you once again have to go back to your creative process of, okay, now this doesn't fit. What changes should I make in order to make it fit in order to answer the customer's demands? And so it's, like you said, it's hand in glove, the creative and the logical process that we need to you know, have in place in order to really innovate successfully. Mm, well said. I love that you framed it that way because it widens the umbrella for innovation. Right. And in companies, Microsoft and everywhere else, it's critical that everybody understands how broad the innovation umbrella is because that determines a number of things, at least in the companies I've worked in, determines budget. Who's responsible for what the time horizon expectation is? If it's an innovation project, oh, it could take five years. Or if it's this type of innovation, it should be done in 18 months. If it's that type of innovation, it should be done in five years. So it's really important what you're highlighting, that the act of refining it and bringing it to market is also part of innovation. Right. That person doesn't always sit, those people, that team doesn't always sit in the quote unquote innovation department. Right. And so when, when people say, oh, we need more innovation or that's an innovation program, sometimes you can kind of talk past each other, at least in my experience, right. in terms of what you're looking for. Yeah. And I think there is also, like we talked about earlier, it's something that you're imagining that is very big, an epic thing that you're imagining that is really what is innovation. 
But then to actually bring it to market, it's going to take several years, like you pointed out, right? I've used this framework in Microsoft where we start to put things together in different horizons. Mm. What is happening in horizon one? What is happening in horizon two? What is happening in horizon three? And horizon one is more immediate, right? Like a few months to a year. Mm -hmm. Horizon two is a couple of years, but horizon three is where your end goal, your promised land is actually reached. And a lot of times it's important for us to set out that vision for horizon three. Mm -hmm. The end goal, what is it that we are trying to achieve? Even though the little intermediate steps are going to be iterative and very small in nature that really move the needle like you know, 0.5% or 0.1%, it's going to be the end goal has to be, the vision has to be painted very clearly. And that is what you know the second principle of leadership I mentioned in Microsoft, which is the generate energy, right? It is important for you to generate energy towards that end goal, for your team to be excited about the innovation that you're trying to bring together as the common goal for the team. In order to do that, you have to paint the dream. You have to paint what the promised land looks like, right. even though a lot of intermediate steps are going to be very tactical and sometimes it doesn't generate a lot of energy, right? But this framework has really helped us in thinking of what is, some people call it the crawl, walk, run, like mm -hmm. what are we doing when we're crawling and what are we doing when you're walking? And then finally, when you're running, I think in Microsoft, we, we do it as horizon one, two, and three, and that really does help. And not just you know thinking about the immediate steps, but also what is it that we're truly trying to achieve here? Mm. Yeah, no, that's a great way of thinking about it. That sort of horizon point of view, I'm curious, most of my background is consumer goods versus tech, you know, diapers, baby wipes, soft drinks. Yeah. And most of that horizon-based thinking was at a program level. Right. And each individual project kind of slotted into one of those horizons. So the three horizons that you described wouldn't exist within one project. Mm. It would be, oh, well, we're thinking about this brand programmatically and these 10 projects, two of them slide in here, two, three of them slide in here and five of them slide in there. In your experience, does that sort of horizon thinking come in at the project level or sort of more the programmatic level for innovation? I think it comes in both levels, but I'll try to sort of make the analogy with what I think of as the project that I'm working on, for example, in the technology in Microsoft, right? Mm -hmm. So when we think of a project, the technology service or a technology product that we are building, mm -hmm. that product has a number of different customers. I'll give you an example of the current service that we are building. It's called TestBase. It's already in market, but uh, you know, mm -hmm. my team sort of imagined it and, and brought it to market from scratch. And this project, it's a cloud service that customers can use to test their applications, right? Yeah. That's the, the purpose of the service. But within that service, which is sort of like in your world, it's probably the project or the product that we are working on. We have several customer personas that we are targeting. Each of them will be a separate work stream. Similarly, we have different features that we'll be working on. Some of them will be about automation and business process, and some of them would be AI. So each of them would be a different work stream. So when you think of it, your program will probably be equal to that service that we are building end to end. And then the project will be equal to the, uh, the work streams that we have, the different customer personas that we are building for, and the different features that we are building. Mm. Uh, but we will be creating the horizon view for that service, the cloud service that we want to bring to market. And we'll be building the MVP for it, but then we'll have different horizons. We'll have different features and different customer personas that we are satisfying. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. The personas in our world, we use the term segmentation and psychographic mm. based segmentation or demographic based segmentation, mm. but they tend to be at the umbrella level. Right. Like we have moms who prefer this mm. or drinkers who are looking for this and then projects and programs aim to serve that demographic right. underneath. So it's fascinating that it's kind of inverted a bit in the tech space. Mm. Or at least in your experience, that's interesting. So we've talked a lot about what innovation is. What isn't innovation? Yeah, so I think when we talked about innovation being this big, epic thing, a way to change the world, to dream up something that doesn't exist at all, I think what is not innovation is the opposite of that, which is like little incremental changes to an existing process or an existing product or, or a service, right? I think, you know, AI is a very good example. It's a bold vision with lots of possibilities and technology. Like I said, it's going to change the way 
we think of the world. It's going to change the way we interact with each other. It's going to change the way students are going to learn and schools are going to teach. It's going to change how we work and how we entertain ourselves and how we communicate and connect with our loved ones. So it's a bold vision and it's going to make the world. I mean, it's the same thing as how when, you know, we started having the entire world in our pockets and our phone, right? I think we are different now. The way we interact with each other, the way the world is, is very different from how it was 25 years ago, right? So I think that's the sort of thing that is innovation. And what's not innovation is if I just add one more feature to one more app on the phone, I think that is not something in my mind that I would classify as innovation. Absolutely necessary, by the way. I think not everything has to be this step function change, this huge thing that we're dreaming up. We have to also make those incremental changes because all of those are customer needs that we have to satisfy, right? Mm, that's right. But I think you know, that is not what I would classify as uh, innovation. For me, innovation is that big epic thing. And those little things that we do once we have brought AI to market, for example, you know, changes to the AI, the models that are servicing the AI experiences in the world, those are all small incremental changes, but you know, not net new innovation. Does that work for you, Jared? Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. The word that came to mind as you were speaking was incremental. It feels like the small feature-based incremental steps of improving a product right. might not necessarily be innovation. The important, necessary value adding, but not necessarily innovation. That makes sense. One thing that occurred to me as you were describing what innovation isn't was I was thinking about your model for career success and thinking about how the concept of innovation might play out in someone's career right. that is directly applied to someone's career. Right. My experience is that it's made up of a whole lot of very small incremental value-adding improvement steps. And I feel like that's what gets talked about in most books and in most career-based advice and other things are the small sort of incremental steps. But as we are talking about innovation and thinking about your book, it feels like you are taking a more innovation, almost driven, even if not directly stated, approach right. more lines up with your definition of innovation. I actually do have a story about this in one of the chapters of my book. It's uh, one of the most useful pieces of career advice I got myself in Microsoft. And it goes like this. So when I was new in the company, it was early in my career, I was new in the company, mm -hmm. maybe not very new. I had actually done a few years of software development in the industry, but also in Microsoft a couple of years. And I was talking to one of my managers. He was an ex-manager at Microsoft. And I was talking to him about how my career was going. And at that, by that time, I had already developed a reputation of being a good developer, an excellent developer in the team, a go-to for certain kinds of innovation, right? But it was all very sort of tactical, right? Like I would be mm. given a project. I would work on the project. It would always be very reliable. My work would be reliable. I would always turn in my work on time. The quality of the work was very good, right? So I was sort of like the go-to developer for those kinds of projects. And I was talking to this manager who had a you know, big influence on my career about, hey, how, is, how do you think I'm doing? You know, what are the things I can improve on? And this was the advice he gave me. He said, Raji, you're very good at your craft, right? You're known in the company, in my team, in the organization as a, as a good developer. You do your work really well, but that's not going to get you to the highest echelons of this company. Mm. What is going to get you to the highest echelons of this company is your ability to take risks. You're right now playing it very safe. You're making sure that you sign up to projects that you know 100% that you're going to deliver. You're not going to fail because you have this tendency to really want to knock it out of the park. So you sign up to the small assignments and you always knock it out of the park for the small assignments. Whenever there is a bit of risk involved, you don't raise your hand and that's going to limit you. Hmm. And that was one of the most useful pieces of advice that I've ever gotten in my career is, you know, that ability to embrace the unknown, to drum up the courage to do big things in your career is going to be your differentiator. Mm. Since then, it's always been at the back of my mind. When you read my book, you'll see a lot of the stories that I have written about. A lot of my experiences are around that ability to sort of, you know, want to take risks. You know, I signed up to keynote in front of 10,000 people, a million people when I had previously, I had not you know, spoken in public uh, too many times as well, right? <laughs> and English is not even my first language. So 
you know, I try to drum up the courage to do big things and take some risks and, you know, have this tendency in the back of my head that it's not going to be a catastrophe, even if I fail in one of these things. Mm. And I think that is what innovation needs, right? You need to be able to take risks. And this is why, you know, even though I work for a big company, I have always signed up to doing little startups. I work with 50 entrepreneurs 25 in Nigeria and 25 in Kenya to bring their own businesses to market for social good. I have built a couple of startups inside Microsoft, right? And these are things that didn't exist. And I actually made a pitch for it with leadership. I got the funding and I, you know, hired the right team, put the right culture in place and found the product market. Mm -hmm. So these are all things that could have spectacularly failed. Maybe one of them actually did have a bit of failure that I had to pivot and I had to reset the course. Mm -hmm. Sure. But at the end of the day, they were really responsible for some of the big changes in my career, some of the big uh, promotions that I got in my career, right? So I think in career success too, that ability to take risks, the ability to embrace the unknown and really continue to innovate has been very important in my career. That makes a lot of sense. That is amazing advice. It's one thing to get great advice. It's another to like lean into actually <laughs> applying it to your careers, which you clearly masterfully did. That's such a great story. So what I think is interesting about your approach to career development is the seven skills, the seven skills that you outline sort of sit in that middle ground between pie in the sky, fluffy, not useful, and like wrote directively technical and specific. Right. And I think that's a hard middle ground for people to sit in and live with because those two tend to be comfort zones for different personality types. Right. And I feel like your seven skills do a, a great job of kind of connecting the sort of high level pie in the sky with how you actually put the rubber to the road and make progress. Right. A lot of the readers of my book actually say that it is super practical and concise, but at the same time, the stories that I have, which is my own lived experience, mm -hmm. my own journey coming into this field as an entry-level engineer and rising to an executive at the company, right? Mm -hmm. And so the stories really are what connect the advice that I'm giving with the reader, right? Right. Because as a reader, the stories are what make the advice tick, right? So mm -hmm. I, I really did not want this to be a big college thesis, right? Right. The purpose of me writing this book was to really empower people with what is necessary to dream big and achieve bigger success in their own life and work. So that's the goal that I had when I wrote this book. And that is the reason why I didn't want it to be too abstract. Mm -hmm. But I also didn't want it to be just a self-help, like do this, do this kind of thing. Right. Yep. I wanted it to be grounded in stories that really help the reader connect the advice with what really happens to an individual in a place like this. That's what I've tried to do with the book. And, the, and that's really resonated with the readers of the book as well. I'm sure it has. Before I let you go, I'd love to know what you do when you're not working. If you have any hobbies or... Oh, I do a ton of them. Yeah. <laughs> How much time do you have, Jared? <laughs> Bring them on. I love hobbies. <laughs> so I actually talk about this as well in the book, in talks that I've given in various places. Well, even though my book is about career success, I think of success as not a unidimensional thing, right? It's mm. not about me getting promoted from one level to another to this big title in a Fortune 50 company. It is important that part of my identity, you know, have being an engineering, a technical leader in a big technology company is an important part of my identity and my success and my work, and my day job is important to me. But I think my success in life is actually much bigger than that. I am a runner. I did not start off in life as a runner. I picked up running when I was 20 years old, when I was in Canada. It does not come very naturally to me, but it's something that really helps me with my mental health and my physical health. Mm. And I continue doing that and I try to continue getting better at it. I'm a photographer. Oh, nice. I love landscape photography. I travel quite a bit. You know, travel gives me all these rich experiences. Mm. And that is an important part of success in life for me is the ability to know about different cultures, connect with different people around the world, and really have those rich experiences in life is an important part of my success. And as I do that, I document with, with photography. I've really gotten into that hobby quite a bit. I do a lot of mentoring in the industry. I do a lot of mentoring. And that's part of like my way of giving back to the community. You know, as a minority in tech, it's something that I really aspire to do is the next generation of 
leaders that want to have success in this field. I want to inspire and help them have those skills. And that is part of the reason why I wrote this book as well, is to kind of help that and, and give back. And that's an important part of my success, to make a difference in the world. I also do a lot of public speaking. And again, that's not something that comes naturally to me. But because I have become a leader, I've picked up these skills that are important for me to communicate ideas, to motivate people, and to represent my team and the work my team does, the technology that we build outside the company as well. So that's something that I enjoy doing now. Wow. I don't have enough hobbies. <laughs> I don't know what to do with my day. <laughs> that's really cool. Do you prefer running inside, indoors, or outdoors? I live in Seattle where it rains a lot. <laughs> okay. You know? Okay. All right. Fair my enough. preference is actually running outdoors, but yeah. I tend to not feel very energized running outdoors when it's like really dreary weather outside. Understandable. So I have a treadmill at home and I yeah. run at home. Yeah. Yeah. Your description of your hobbies was very visual travel and then photography and landscape photography in particular. It makes sense that you'd have a preference to run outdoors versus indoors. And it also makes sense that it wouldn't be quite the benefit that it normally is. Yeah. Or it would be in other places. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. It's always interesting to me because people who are interested in innovation, interested in career development, all those sorts of things, like you said, it's not a unidirectional thing. Yeah. It's part of who you are and part of how you move through life. Yeah. And I'm a lifelong learner too. I read yeah. a lot of books. You know, when I'm not doing these other things, you usually will find me just sitting in front of my fireplace and reading a book. Oh, well, nice. Yeah, I love reading as well. That's something that has been very, not only just, you know, helping me with my mental health, but also really helping me with learning and advancing and really creating new ideas for innovation as well, right? So mm. I pick up a lot of things from even the books that I read that have nothing to do with my field. I tend to pick up ideas. And then the next day I come to work and I'm like, hey, I read this about the, I don't know, Israeli military. Maybe we should think about this for our product that we're building, right? <laughs> right, so, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, that's great. So it's really uh, helpful. That sort of analogical thinking is, uh, is very helpful. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes even when you're not calling on it, you make the connections unconsciously. Exactly. Yeah. I'm big into audio books. I want to get back to reading physical books more. The convenience of audio books has gotten me locked into that lately. So yeah, the sitting by the fire, reading a book, that's inspirational. I'm going to work toward that. Before I let you go, this has been an amazing conversation. And again, so grateful for you taking the time. I just would love for you, if you have any advice for innovators that you'd like to share, I'd love for you to share that if you would. Yeah. And this is something maybe because I've been thinking a lot about AI recently, it's something very top of mind for me. It probably applies to many things that we do. But the ethics and the responsibility of what you do is super, super important. Mm. Just don't forget that. Always keep that in the forefront of your mind. I think it's important for you to think about how to do things responsibly. You are building, you're making products for people, you're building technology for people. So that people element is super important. And lastly, I think we want to build a world where compassion and diversity thrive. That is something that is super, super important because, you know, we are building things for the entire global community, especially if you're a technologist, you're building products for the entire global community that is full of diversity. And you want to have the diversity in mind with the team that you're building the products with, but also the things that you're building, you have to keep the diversity world in mind and aim for having a compassionate world. Mm, a compassionate world. That's beautiful. That's amazing advice. Thank you so much, Raji Rajagopalan, Director at Microsoft. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your expertise with me and with our audience. And I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you, Jared. Thank you for having me. This was fantastic. All right. Take care. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this week's show. You can drop us a line on Twitter at Outlast LLC. O-U-T-L-A-S-T. LLC, or follow us on LinkedIn, where we're at last consulting. Until next time, keep innovating, whatever that means. <laughs>